We're live from our studios here at Kokomlimli in Accra. This is John News Prime with me, Samuel Kojo Braze. Our list is this our third accused in the ongoing ambulance procurement trial. Richard Jackpa says he attempted to cut a deal with Godfrey Yabu Adame to make him a prosecution witness when the AG told him he could not file knowledge prosecutor for him. Details as Jackpa says he is at war with the Attorney General who had betrayed him in the ongoing trial. Says that we think will further our cause. There was no decision to use him as a witness. The only decision was to use a witness that we have pencil to call. Well, near chaos in Parliament as the trial of minority leader takes a toll on the business of the House as NDC MPs vow to scuttle proceedings whenever their leader has to attend court. Direct the clerk and table to conduct a head count. What in? They were recognized. No, we must correct that. Honorable Chief. You were recognized. Come in. When you walk in, you were recognized. We take you to Parliament, where the House has been struggling to form quorum to transact business. Also coming up as public hospitals introduce makeshift laboratories to ease the plight of patients. Join News is learning some patients are postponing lab tests following the exorbitant amount charged by private laboratories. Yesterday, yeah, I know that the lab it's very expensive. It's not normal no, money they take. I pay everything, but still the result is not ready. Well, the third accused person in the ongoing ambulance procurement trial, Richard Jackpa, has told court that at one point in the case, he approached the attorney general and suggested to him to make him a prosecution witness when the AG told him he could not file knowledge prosecutor for him despite his innocence. He contends in open court that that betrayal by Godfrey Yabo Adame made him angry and pushed him to declare war against the attorney general. On the day, the trial judge cautioned the Godfrey Yabo Adame to stop interject, inter interjecting Richard Jackpa's testimony to the court, though he wasn't the one conducting the case. Richard Jackpa says he refused Godfrey Yabo Adame's explanation that he is a collateral damage in the trial. Latif Idris was in court for us and has come through this report. Richard Jaqua said he is angry at the Attorney General because the Attorney General had assured him that he would let him go at the no case submission stage of this particular trial only, to, only for him, Godfrey Yabu Adame, to disappoint him uh, and so he is angry at him and according to Richard Jaqua he declared war between himself and the Attorney General at the residence of his cousin uh, Unicolendi when they met after the Attorney General had uh, sort of disappointed him when it came to the no case submission stage when he failed to back him. He declared war against the Attorney General and said that the Attorney General could go on and use all the legal brains that he had, but him, Richard Jackpa, would also go to his underworld powers and then they would see who would survive on the street. He said, the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabu Adami, had told him, Richard, da Richard Jackpa, that he, Richard Jackpa, is a collateral damage in the ongoing trial and that he will be acquitted at the end of this ongoing case. And Richard Jackpa told him that he doesn't want to be a collateral damage because he is innocent and he's lost all his dealings, his international networks has been lost as a result and that was when he declared war on the Attorney General. The Attorney General's uh, Deputy Attorney General, Alfred Atuyayabua, speaking to journalists after the trial said, the declaration of war as stated by Richard Jackpa in open court today has put the Attorney General Department and the Attorney General himself on a lookout and they are going to take the necessary measures to ensure that the Attorney General Godfrey Yebu Adami is safe. You heard matters. You make your own judgment out of what you heard. You heard issues about someone operating in the underworld and someone using his legal skills, declaration of war against the Attorney General. All this is came up. So, interesting proceedings. What do you make of the fact that the Attorney General rejected an appeal he made to him to make him a witness when he said you couldn't get him uh, something he had requested for? That is the prerogative of Attorney General, and we use witnesses that we think will further our cause. There was no decision to use him as a witness. The only decision was to use a witness that we have pencil to call. 
we tended what we had on our phone 100%. If he has others, he knows what to do because he's still in the box. What do you also make that he make the point that there was never a plea bargain discussion between himself and the Attorney General? We'll get there. They are documentary. We'll get there. Today we'll go to a certain point. So we'll come to the chapter three and you hear all those things. And how are the claim that he has entered a war on Attorney General? I think it's quite unfortunate to be frank with you because that direction of war, according to him, whether he's acquitted or whether he's convicted, he's, he's declared that war. So he has put us on notice. And so the needed steps will be taken. Oh, well. If indeed he said it to the Attorney General at his cousin's house, he should be aware of that already, not in open court. AG has not admitted such a thing. And so now that we've heard it in open court, you will take the necessary steps. As in security-wise for the Attorney General? We take the necessary steps. What, what would that step entail? That step, when we take it, you get to know it. Uh, Felix Kwachi of Fosu, who is a member of the opposition, NDC, told journalists that the declaration of war by Richard Jakpa doesn't hurt his case. We get the sense that the Attorney General wants to see that Mr. Jakpa is doing this uh, in retribution for what he believed to be the Attorney General's failure to keep his part of the bargain. But the point is that Mr. Jakpa insisted that he has not said anything that hasn't happened. If I have discussions with you and we agree that you will do something and you fail to do it, and I come out to say that we agreed that we will do this and didn't do it, I have not said anything that is not true. If it were the case that Mr. Jakpa was saying things that have been proven to be untrue by the court, then you could say that some damage has been done to his reputation. But as of now, as far as he's concerned, he has not said anything that did not happen. So whether he was exercising a right of reply, or his right to react to what the AG did to him is completely immaterial in this regard. What matters is that is he saying the truth? What is he saying? Is the AG able to contradict him? Well, the trial of the minority leader, Dr. Kesela Tufosin, is taking a major toll on the business of parliament after the NDC MP's decision to boycott proceedings whenever their leader is in court. The, today, the NDC MP's boycotted a large part of the proceedings until their minority leader returned from court only to enter the chamber and raise issues of quorum. Parliamentary Affairs correspondent Kweku Asante has a wrap of proceedings from the House. The trial of Dr. Kesela Tufosin for causing financial loss to the state is happening in the court but having a cascading effect on the business of the House. You will recall last week when the House resumed, the minority did indicate that whenever their leader was in court for his trial, they would boycott proceedings. In fact, today they did. And today, sitting started nearly 3 p.m. because the minority MPs were not coming to the floor and the majority MPs also were not in their numbers. In fact, when sitting started, the MPs on the floor were not even up to 20. Later on, when the trial ended and the minority leader did walk into the floor, the NDC MPs started raising issues of quorum. There is still no quorum. Suspend sitting of the House for a period of not more than one hour. Mr. Speaker, can you direct the clerk and table to con conduct a head count? What in they were recognized. No, we must correct that. Honorable uh, Chief. What you were recognized. When you walk in, you are recognized. And when you walk in and you got up to speak, you are recognized. Let that go on the records. What is that? The second Deputy Speaker, Andrew Marquez Yama, was now under pressure to act according to the dictates of the standing orders. The standing orders provide that whenever an MP raises an issue of quorum, he should instruct the table office to get the bells to be rung in the house. The bell did rung, and after 10 minutes, James Kluchaveji was on his feet again pressuring the Speaker of Parliament to actually go by the dictates of the House and suspend Parliament. This nearly degenerated into chaos because according to the Deputy Speaker, as per his time, the 10 minutes provided by the standing orders had not reached, but it's not something the NDC MPs were ready to countenance. I don't know the time you are using. Uh, my time is not up yet. <laughs> I'm monitoring my time. Mr. Speaker. Mr. My Speaker, time is not up to 10 time minutes. That the bell was rung. When the bell was rung, we all heard it. If you are telling this house on, on me that you are using your time, I'm left with two minutes. Standing order, regulate the conduct of the house. 
if our own standing order says it. Why? No. Clerk at table. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Clerk at table. Mr. Speaker. We are not asking you now Clark to go. Clerk at table. Mr. Speaker. You, we are not asking you Please now to go. Let, let count, the, count the members. No. Ultimately, the MPs on the floor were not up to 92, which would allow for MPs to proceed the business and then proceeded to suspend sitting for an hour. It is clear that the minority are not willing to back down on their demand that the trial of the minority leader should cease. According to James Klucha Veji and MP for Kim Tamponov, they are not trying to frustrate government business, but they are only asking for the right thing to be done. We are here. We are here. We are ready to work. Is Honorable Atoforsen, who is the leader of the minority, also not qualified to represent his people? So if he's there every day in court, are they not concerned that by that act, they are, he's also not representing his people? If they want us to do the work, and which they attempt frustration, then they should allow Honorable Atoforsen to also represent his people. They should drop the case. It is just right that as a leader of the minority, we also show some sympathy and solidarity with him. Oh, if even it's midnight, we'll now be transacting government business. Why not? We'll do. But in any case, it should be on record that now it's even the minority who are always more in the house. You are in the house here. You have been seeing it. Let your cameras always report it. It's we, the minority, who are always more even in the house. In the coming days, more and more government business, key bills, among others, are expected to come to the floor. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, when the minority leader is away in court, being prosecuted for causing financial loss to the state, the house will suffer. It is not clear how long the minority intend to hold this, but they say that they are not going to relent in making this demand that the prosecution of their minority leader is dropped. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Now, an emergency meeting between the National Labor Commission and the striking medical laboratory scientist has just concluded at the Commission's head office here in Accra. The scientists citing nearly two years of negotiations without an agreement on their conditions of service continue their strike. Representatives from the Ministries of Health and Finance and the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission participated in the meeting. My colleague Michael Ashley was at the meeting and is just returning from the meeting. He joins us now live on Zoom for more. M Michael, what can you report from this meeting? Well, Brace, so mm. the meeting um, ended just about an hour ago. Okay. We managed to speak with the striking staff. Mm. And from what they tell us, the general secretary who addressed the media tells us that, first of all, well, they are happy to meet the National Labor Commission to get government to come back to the negotiating table. But they are unhappy because they came empty-handed and they are leaving empty-handed. Those are the words of the general secretary mm. of the lab scientists. Now, why is he saying that? He says that well, they came hoping that the National Labor Commission will make some directives to government, that is the Fair Wages Salaries Commission and the Ministry of Health, to abide by it, or at least meet them with some demand, something in hand, but that they did not get. Mm. So as it stands now, we understand from what they tell us is that the National Labor Commission has directed them to go back to the negotiated table with government. And then secondly, you also call off the strike. You know that is an unspoken rule mm. at the labor front that you cannot be on strike and be negotiating. So that is something you have to do. What we are told from the union and you'll be hearing from him shortly, that is the General Secretary of the Striking Lab Scientist, which is um, Dr. Sefas Akoto. He tells us that they will go back and consult their grass members, mm. and then they will consider calling off the strike. Mm. Very tough meeting for us uh, at the Labor Commission. Um, we are not very happy because our expectations are not met. But all the same, we are all Ghanaians. Uh, we will take the advice of the commission. And uh, we want to get back to our National Executive Council to communicate to them the decision of the commission. Uh, based on the decision of the National Executive Council, we will have engagement with our membership. But for now, uh, we cannot say the strike is suspended. It is still ongoing until the determination of the National Executive Council. 
uh, we appeal to our clients to bear with us in this difficult time. Uh, we ourselves are affected by the strike. We are not happy with what is going on, but we are compelled looking at the difficulties on the ground, and we pray that the outcome of next meeting will favor all of us. So what was the decision of the NLC? What was the directive to you? Uh, the directive of the NLC will be released. Uh, they are putting it together, but we believe that if the duty bearers will act upon it, we'll all be happy at the end of the day. Meanwhile, it is imagined that Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CTAG, have been asked to also call off their strike. Joining us on the line now uh, with details of that particular meeting is the president of CTAG, Prince Obeying Him. I'm grateful to you, sir, for joining. Now, can you confirm if you've been directed to call off your strike? Um, good evening to all your cherished viewers mm. and the teachers across the 46 public colleges of education in Ghana. Yes, we came out uh, from the meeting today about mm. a couple of hours ago, and the following uh, issues uh, came up were part of the directives given by the National Labor Commission. One, it's important to mention that the commission never declared our strike illegal. Okay. Two, it is important also to mention that the commission has asked the employer to immediately comply with the arbitral awards, which from, uh, I mean, May 2nd, 2023, the government mm. or the employer have not complied with. And they've also been asked to do so with respect to the, uh, the, the, the staff audit conducted within the colleges by the uh, GTEC. And then uh, it also came out that the NLC has even uh, taken the employer to court. Mm. Employer, employer here, you mean government? Well, Prince, Prince Obinghima is president of CTAG. I, I guess I still have him on the line. Prince, if, if you're on the line, you were at a point where you say that the NLC has taken the employer to court. I'm asking whether the employer here, you mean government? Prince Obinghima, uh, if you are still on the line, uh, you were telling us that the NLC has taken government to court. Is that it? Well, so we understand that the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CTAG, have been directed to call off their strike. And Prince Obinghima, who is president of CTAG, is giving us some details of this. Now, what does it really mean? Does it mean that, I mean, uh, they're going to call off their strike or they, are, they aren't. He also says that they, the government or the employer has been directed to obey an arbitrary award that uh, was awarded against government. We want to understand what that really means. What's, what was the tiny details of this particular uh, you know, arbitrary award there and whether or not it's true that, in fact, NLC has taken the employer to uh, court. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to that particular development in this bulletin. But let's now turn our attention to the hospitals where many patients are feeling the pinch of the four-day strike by the medical laboratory scientists. Public hospitals have been forced to rely on the services of private laboratory facilities as a temporary measure for patients requiring lab tests as a strike by the laboratory scientists enter day four. Emphasis by Joy News to the LECMA hospital revealed that patients needing lab tests are directed to makeshift laboratories operated by private individuals. One of the lab centers is located on the premises of the hospital with another located a few meters away from the west wing of the facility. But the patient that visit these private laboratories pay three times more than they would with their lab resort, taking more than a day to be released. Kenneth Jesse was there and reports. The reception for the laboratories here at the Lekma Hospital, you see patients lined up here. We also have some of them seated here. Some of them are waiting for their test results. Others are also now trooping in to come and get tested. Now they've raised a lot of concerns. One of them is how fast they get their results. Ordinarily they would have gotten it the very day they did the test but now they would have to wait for 24 hours or more to get their results. Uh, I was here at think three days today. Uh, they say I should come and do lab, but since yesterday, nobody is here. There is people here, but they, but they say that uh, they are in strike. So, 
They are not, I am not able to get my results. So I came to the two. And the boy is still there. It's an emergency. Yesterday, yeah, I know that the lab is very expensive. It's not normal no, money they take. I pay everything, but still the result is not ready. Today, I was feeling headache and chest pain. And blood was coming through my nose. Yes, so I came yesterday. They said it, it could be the holy heart. I'm a holy heart patient. So I came yesterday. They said I should come and do the lab today. The uh, two lab. The other one was medical ward, and the other one. This one was the X-ray. The other one was the lab. Yes. So I came to do the lab. They said they are on strike, and the amount they gave me was one one twenty cities. Yes, to do to the uh, to do uh, at the private uh, laboratory. I want to one cash and share, but me drew O P D or no one case or one 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 co a demonstration to private uh, lab for no one. And I may expect this and then so scan and then lab I'm buy and then come buy hundred and something say three three thirty. The head of administration at the Lekma Hospital, Charles Banafo, tells me that the strike is having constraints on their revenue generation because the laboratory gives them quite a huge amount of money but due to its closure they are losing revenue from that. As you are aware the, head, the lab they are the ones who helps in investigations yeah so once they are not there and the department is not functioning it has double effect one getting access to investigation to be able to take clinical decisions and two also their generation also affect the revenue of the institution yeah so it's something that is a setback that has to be sorted as soon as possible. Yes, it does. Serious effect because when there is an impression, they have to do investigations, and most of the investigations come from the lab. Yeah, so once they are not there, it's a huge setback, and uh, we can't compromise on it. Well, the striking laboratory scientists are demanding better working conditions from the employer, which is government. Until then, they have vowed not to return to duty. From the Lekema Hospital in the Greater Accra region, Kenneth Jesse. For Joy News. Let's now take you to the Volta region because pupils of the Adromi Junior High School in the Ketu North Municipality of the Volta region continue to risk their lives studying under a weak structure. This has led to a decline in academic performance and enrollment. As parents in neighboring communities prefer to enroll their children in distant schools to ensure their safety. There is more in this report by Fred Kwame Asari. The Adrume Junior High School was established in 1991 and was provided a pavilion structure by the then Jerry John Rawlings government. The community mobilized and erected blocks around the pavilion to make it a bit more comfortable for academic works. It was uh, something that he really was uh, appreciated of. So he added a workshop to that with a full instrument that those days would be doing technical skills that will facilitate learning and teaching for the teachers and the students. So this is the current state of the then uh, workshop given to us. However, the over 30 years old structure is gradually deteriorating. The block has developed cracks at several portions which puts the lives of the teachers and learners at risk. Some window members have fallen off, exposing the students to the mercy of the weather. When it is raining, it disrupts academic activities. They have to wait until the rain stops before they can continue with learning activities. Children from other communities used to come here, but due to the dilapidating state of the classroom block, they have been moved to other schools. Community members fear the unfortunate might happen due to the weak state of the structure. Nonetheless, a three-unit classroom block constructed with funding from the District Development Fund is under lock and key. According to the community authorities, the assembly cited construction defects, hence instructed the contractor to correct them before the facility is handed over. About four years on, nothing has been done to that effect, as the pupils continue to study under the weak structure. So since then, from 1990s to date, there is no government infrastructure in the name of or in the history of Adruma Junior High School. We are really, really appreciated of it, but this project has been put up for years now. 
which has not been released for even the schools to be using. Looking at the current state, at least if this was commissioned for them to be using, it would have been helpful to at least to facilitate teaching and learning uh, uh, studies or materials to be ongoing. We have a whole building without even a store facility, not even to talk of a place for teachers to sit down. Traditional authorities have lamented the state of the current classroom block, adding that it is affecting academic performance of the learners. The state of the structure inconveniences the students, hence they are not able to learn as expected of them. So we are appealing to the government, the new block which has been completed and locked should be made available for use by the learners. It is the prayer of the authorities that the government will listen to their plea and hand over the classroom block in earnest. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Adrume. Well, this is still the Joy News Prime. We'll take a quick break here. We'll be back with more. Please do stay. Welcome back from the break. Let's do election headquarters. And election headquarters is brought to you by Petrosol, your clean fall in full quantity, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountant, AICPA, together as the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Also by the German Ozone Medical Center, Alternative Therapy, Dental, Wellness and Beauty. Shop box Technologies, a convenient service, and Youth Bridge Foundation. Election headquarters for an informed electorate. Now, the former president and flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, John Dramani Mahama, says his party is going into the 2024 general elections with what he refers to as their own referee. He says the Electoral Commission has been filled with known current governing NPP party folks denting the independence and fair image of the electoral body. He says the posture by the Electoral Commissioner depicts a potential inability to conduct free and fair elections in 2024. Speaking at the Christian Service University in Kumasi, Ms. Mahama said the NDC will, quote, punch the new patriotic party in a way the EC cannot rig on their behalf. In 2020, a lot of things went wrong. And we don't accuse the Electoral Commission for nothing. There were circumstances that we have raised over and over again about the Electoral Commission not being neutral. Indeed, it might also be the fact that this government concocted reasons to remove the three Electoral Commissioners and replace them with people of their choice. Some of those who are appointed to the commission are people with known NPP credentials. Even though the president has the power to appoint, you must make sure that the person you appoint has no uh, uh, iota or evidence of partisan political uh, uh, affiliation. But this president doesn't care. People who were patrons of Tescon, Today are sitting on the Electoral Commission. A commissioner said that NDC was the most serious existential threat to Ghana's democracy. A commissioner. And he is still a commissioner. He described NDC as the biggest existential threat to Ghana's democracy. And he's still there. How do you expect somebody like that to conduct a free and fair uh, election? But, like Azuma Nelson said, this time we're going into the ring with our own referee. And that is what happened when Azuma went to fight Jeff Fenech in Australia. And Ghanaians were upset with Azuma because he accepted to go and fight in Australia. And he said Ghanaians shouldn't worry. And that he's going into the, referee, uh, into the ring with his own referee. And everybody was confused who his referee was. And he said his referee are uh, his punches. And that he will punch Jeff Fenech to the extent that when the man is down, you can't declare 
him the winner. And truly, that's what he did. I think it was round five. The finish was on the floor. He couldn't get up. Which referee will come and say that the finish won the fight? So we are going into this battle with our own referee. We will punch the MPP down so hard that the Electoral Commission cannot and will never. Declare them as winners. We will emerge. I'm certain of it. Now, a second-year student of the Christian Service University has sustained a head injury after he was allegedly assaulted by some supporters of the National Democratic Congress in Kumasi. The incident happened at a public lecture organized by, uh, to mark the school's 50th anniversary addressed by former president and flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama. The victim, Nana Boachi, who is said to be an organizer of the NPP student's wing, Tescon, is alleged to have retorted to Mr. Mohammed's description of Dr. Mahmoud Baumia as a comedian in a speech. Nana Yaojima caught up with the victim and has come through with this report. The NDC flag bearer delivering his lecture at the Christian Service University took a swipe at his NPP opponent, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Ghanaians are in dire streets. And this is not the time for comedy. This is not the time for concert party about passing a mythical steer to somebody. Many of the people gathered at the public lecture applauded the job, but the Tescon organizer of the NPP at the university was unhappy. Nana Boache allegedly retorted to the statement to the hearing of people seated with him. But an NDC supporter did not take the statement lightly. I also responded, Sir um, Mahama Obwa Na Oberi. That was what I said. Then later on, I saw a metro man who approached me and giving me some warning that be careful, be careful. So I also asked him, What have I done? And then the moment I asked the question, he came directly to me and slapped me in front of um, the former president when he was um, answering some questions that, be, that has been um, asked by some of the students. So a lecturer um, in our, on, on, on our campus asked me to leave where I was sitting and then find a different place to sit. So I left where I was sitting and then uh, suddenly um, the former um, term president came to me that he has heard that um, the people are chanting that they will kill me, they will do this and that, bad things to me. So it's better I leave the auditorium and then find a good place to hide. So quickly I listened to him and then followed him. So on our way out of the auditorium, when we got to the main entrance of the auditorium, I heard another slap. Fine. So out of that, I, I, I was unable to see anything or something sort of that. And then I had I, I also um, saw uh, one guy also who, who held my hand back and they started beating me, my stomach, my head and stuff. The second year student of communications has his head wrapped in a bandage. A splint also supports his arm. An attempt to rescue him proved futile. I'm feeling very weak. My head is very, very pain in me. And this, uh, my, I cannot lift my hand because I felt... Um, I have had some fracture here, so I'm waiting for the CCTV scan, then I'll, I'll take the next step. I feel unsafe, very, very unsafe, because some of them came with their phones and then they took pictures of me, threatening that they know where I stay, the car I drive, so they are going to track me. That makes me very, very unsafe. Meanwhile, the NPP in the Ashanti region is appalled by the situation. The victim is yet to file a complaint to the police. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Kumasi. Well, supporters of the New Patriotic Party in the Wale Wale constituency are urging the National Executive Council to resolve the election dispute between the candidate-elect Dr. Tia Mahama Kabiru and the defeated incumbent MP Hajia Lariba Zuweratu Abudu. The conflict arose after Laiba Abudu contested the election result favoring Kabiru Baumia's advisor. At a Walla Walla press conference, supporters appealed to the NEC to address Abudu's conduct, which they say is causing party disunity 
and threatening its electoral prospects. There is more in the following report. Ladies and gentlemen, we are calling on NEC to call Ajiyan Lalwazuela Abudu, the MP for Walawali, to order because her conduct is causing disaffection in the party in Walawali. Surprising that the MP who benefited from the party structure and support during the primaries now disputes the outcome. Her refusal to accept defeat and support the elected candidate may harm the party's chance in 2024 and elections beyond. We urge the party leadership to intervene and persuade her to accept the will of the people and support the elected candidate. Dr. Alaji Zia Mahama Kabiru. We fear that her conduct may cause us deceit and harm the party's unity. We cannot allow individual interests to hold the party hostage. <laughs> We are tired of her. She is very disrespectful and has no regard for anyone in Walewale here. She is refusing to step down because of her corrupt and nefarious acts. But we are demanding that she go. We are doing this because we want Dr. Baobian to win the elections. But we will not hesitate to vote against him if he continues to support her so-called sister against Now, health civil society organizations are raising concerns about gaps in Ghana's vaccine procurement, fearing a significant rise in child mortality rate. This follows the announcement that Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, will cease funding 80% of Ghana's vaccines due to the country's new middle income status. Ghana will now need to cover 100% of its vaccine procurement, but Executive Director of the Hope for Future Generation, Cecilia Seno, warns of dire consequences if the country fails to secure vaccines for zero-dose immunization. There is more in the following report. Currently, Gafik's Vaccine Alliance finances 80% of Ghana's vaccine procurement, with the Ghanaian government covering the remaining 20%, as Gafix supports only low-income countries. It plans to withdraw funding due to Ghana's middle-income status, requiring the government to fully finance vaccine procurement. Help for Future Generation, in collaboration with traditional and religious leaders, health professionals, academics and other groups, is advocating for increased domestic resources, mobilization and expand immunization coverage. Executive Director for Hope for Future Generation, Cecilia Senna, has urged government to commit to meeting the country's vaccine needs, stressing the importance of sustaining immunization efforts to prevent a rise in child mortality rates. Government is not just governing, but the future of your people you are governing is important. If this country is unable to secure few, the vaccine for children because the donor has hesitated, that means that we have failed the future generations. And we don't hope that this will happen. Our expectation is that the advocacy that we are doing, we are not doing it for ourselves, but we are doing it for people who cannot speak. And people need to talk for them. And so if the government doesn't listen to what we are doing, then we will see what will happen. But I hope that they are listening to us because they've been able to respond to a number of things. We are still engaging them, so we hope they will continue supporting this important advocacy. That is the role of civil society, and we are doing our best. You know, when people are looking for whatever you say, they accept it. They agree. So they've all accepted, they agree that it's a very good policy brief. What we have to do is, after the election, because the promises that they have made, many of them have included. The Western and Western North regions have got new champions of the National Science and Maths Quiz. After a four-day-long competition among 34 schools, St. Joseph's School pulled a surprise one past 2021 champions 
Archbishop Porter Gales and the 2022 champions Shama SHS to win with 33 points. The road to the grand finale was not a smooth one for all schools because Archbishop Porter Gales had to manage only two points past Amen Fiman to qualify. James Averji has a wrap of events in the following report. Today will be the Western Zonal Championship where one school will go home with a bragging right as champions of the Western Zone of this year's National Science and Maths Quiz. Now, two schools um, at my right, you see Shama uh, Senior High School, and then on my left, you see Ghana Secondary Technical School. How prepared are you? What is the mood this morning? We are so very, very happy. We are, we are very prepared this morning. And we are here to take back the crown as we did last two years. Shama Senior High Regional Champion. Let's talk. Let's talk. What's holding us? Yes, he's holding us. God is holding us. Yes, he's holding us. This year we are taking it. Today, this year, 2024, we are taking the NSM quiz. The quiz, we are taking it. You see, Jehovah Shama, the, the name Shama means God is there. And indeed, God has proven that he's really there here with us. He, God, the God of Shama has come here. And We've he, just experienced a nerve-wracking contest there in the second contest of the Western North Zonal Championship. Now, that contest was between Archbishop Porter Girls and Menfima, as well as Sergio also Senior High Schools. Now, at the end, they came out with 26 points, Archbishop Porter Girls. And Menfima came with 24 points, two point difference. And Sergio also came with 19 points. Uh, uh, What's your name? Eliezer Ando. Eliezer, I saw you truly broken down, shedding tears at the end of the competition. What was going through your mind? A lot of bad feelings in my head. And I am hoping that next year we will come up strong. Which year are you? Second year. What do you think went wrong for your school? The last riddle. Well, there is more on our website at majoronline.com. We'll take a break here. We'll be back with more. Do stay. Well, time for us to do show business now, and Becky Bex is here. Okay, hi. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, oh. We have Regirock Stone in the news. So mm. the godfather of hip life, Regirock Stone, has been speaking about the fate of music genre. The music genre spearheaded 30 years ago. As you all know, hip life was the main sound from Ghana in the late 90s to mid 2000s, even before Azonto and Afrobeats took center stage speaking. On the A55 podcast, Regirock Stone told the host, Ni Akrofis Matabe, that unlike the days when Ghana had a music identity like high life and hip life, the country doesn't seem to have one now. For you as the one who named this movement hip life, what do you say to those who question if hip life is still alive or not? I mean, I think it's very natural. You know, if you check the trajectory of how everything is moving, you know, things evolve. I, I wouldn't say it's dead. I mean, as long as Sakwadi and them, medical is filling the whole tube, you know, he's a hip life artist. There's no doubt. He's rapping in tree over the hip hop beats. Sakwadi is still very strong. So, in, in terms of holding the brand name, it's probably the topic to be debated right now, you know. And, uh, you know, young people do young things. You know, young people are impressionable. Mm -hmm. And so whatever new style pops up is where they're going to go to, which might be detrimental to the patriotic side of things when it comes to us, because as it stands right now, we don't seem to have an ID, mm -hmm. which is crazy. I mean, this life was popping way before the new reemergence of Afrobeat uh, yeah. became. Mm -hmm. and But they have a brand. They have a name they're moving with. Yeah. And you ask Ghanaians what they what style they on now. They you know some say Afro this, some say hip rap. It's crazy. But if we are all united on a, on one front and we have a tag, it kind of moves the movement a little faster. Because mm -hmm. this is what happened when hip life took off. We had a name, 
and we were moving in the name of the name. You see what I'm saying? But you know, like I said, it's, it's a new day. Now I asked if he was hopeful hip life would continue to exist. Eric Stone, who acknowledged the sound of hip life is changing, said he was hopeful and urged hip life musicians to think about the patriotic roots of the music style as it grows. Say 10 years from now, or mm -hmm. even 15, 20 years from now, do you still see hip life taking on new forms, new sounds? It, um, it, it already has. Mm -hmm, it yeah. already has. That's what but do you Black see changing further, is what I mean? Yeah, that's what Black Sharif just showed us. It already has. His sound, his whole uh, approach, everything, you know, that's it right there. As to whether they will bring back the whole movement and reestablish it for patriotic reasons or for reasons uh, that are to Ghana, that's a whole other thing. But yeah. Would you love to see that though? That the, the of course I'm a I'm a yeah I'm a patriot I am I mean why would I be in the wilderness you know people asking young folks who come from a very rich background you know when we when hip life set off we were in, on the in the forefront in Africa with the exception of Senegal uh, we were on the forefront you know people we inspired a lot of people uh, and so why why would I yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's a great move. If you have a name and an ID, it, it goes a long way. It institutes national pride, all of the above, you know. But when you don't know where, you know, you seem to be trying to follow whatever's hot, whatever's trending, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, they when they don't want you in the door, they will not let you in the door. You know, I keep telling them, I said, Nigeria got enough already, you know, they, there's enough Afrobeat artists over there trying to make it. Yeah. And so, you know. Right, like, right. Okay, and then there was this guy, uh, Kim, Lumba, Lumba Brother. They have another song. And then that one gets famous. Any song that you talk about girls or a landlord. And, and, and for me, that's not the kind of songs I talk. I'm right. talking about songs, how, how you people suffer, people are surviving, how about a life history. Mm. I'm not talking about this kind of particular story. Sorry. So okay. in, in, in music, we have different stories to give. Okay. But my message of story, it was too boring to the Ghanaians. It wasn't. Me was Samana Bay. I am called Bravo, me was Samana Bay. I am called Bravo, me was Samana Bay. <laughs> Tongo wow. Zimba, don't forget that the story of Atongo Zimba will yeah. be on E Vibes, the part two, mm. uh, this weekend on Joy News and on Joy Prime. You should not miss it. And that'll be all for the show this evening. We're grateful for your time. Mm. Please join us same time tomorrow. And mm. don't forget to use Pepsodent yep. when you brush your teeth. Because with Pepsodent, every, every smile matters. Well, Emma Davis is up next with Prime Business. Thanks for being a part of us. There's more on myjoinline.com. We'll meet again, go willing, tomorrow. Okay.